All right, so I want to give you an example of some of the things we've been talking about with the plasma membrane. So this handout uh, 3E, we're going to kind of introduce it using some of our PowerPoint slides. So this PowerPoint slide just simply says uh, diffusion occurs from high concentration to low and we may need a channel protein to move material that's too large. So if you look at this picture on the right, all right, I'm going to get my cursor up here. If you look at the picture on the right, what you're going to see, oops, sorry, what you're going to see is an example of molecules that can go straight through the membrane through just plain diffusion from high concentration to low. You've got other molecules that need these transport proteins. All right, so that's all that that's showing you and it's describing facilitated diffusion. The next um, handout, or I'm sorry, the next PowerPoint slide is a, just a little bit more discussion about osmosis. And we've talked about this a little bit when we handled uh, handout 1B with antidiuretic hormone. If you recall, I used words like hypertonic and isotonic for the description of our uh, antidiuretic hormone. Our body wants to be in homeostasis, which is this middle beaker. So imagine that I've got some red blood cells and I put those red blood cells into a beaker that is isotonic. That means that it has the same concentration of salt in the beaker to the cell. So when that occurs, if we have an isotonic solution. We have the same amount of water moving in and out of the cell. So the cell just sits there. All right. This is homeostasis. This is what we really want. Now, if we become dehydrated and hypertonic, what happens is we've got a uh, lower concentration of water in our cells and a higher concentration, I'm sorry, a, a lower concentration of salt in our cells and a higher concentration of salt in our body, in this beaker. So if that occurs, what's going to happen is, remember, water moves from low salt to high salt. So the lower salted cell is going to lose water. Water is going to exit out the cell into the higher salt solution of our body. When this happens, the cell shrivels up. We call it crenation. The cell shrivels up. So as we get dehydrated, water is going to leave our cells and go out into our body, into the bloodstream, and the uh, interstitial fluid of our tissues. So our cells are going to lose a bunch of water. Now, I mean, think about this. A cell's not going to work very well if it is shriveled up and, and um, undergoes crenation. So this causes cell dysfunction. So the more dehydrated you get, the more water leaves the cell and the worse the cell functions. And so we're moving out of homeostasis if we become hypertonic. So what do we have to do? We have to add more water to our body so that the water concentration changes and water can then flow back into the cell, uh, making the cell normal again, back to being isotonic. So this is what happens when we are dehydrated. This is why you can't drink salt water. Even though uh, seawater has a water in it, it has too much salt. So when you drink that salt water, imagine your digestive system is this beaker. So your digestive system is full of salt. The cells of your body don't have as much salt. The water is going to go from low salt to high salt and all of your cells are going to dehydrate 
as the water leaves them to go into your digestive system. And that's why people who drink salt water often start hallucinating. It's because their brain cells are shriveling up and uh, they can't think properly. Now the opposite of this can also occur where if we have the reverse, where we have a low salt content in the beaker and a high, higher con uh, salt content in the cell, what can happen is what well, we get a hypotonic solution and water is going to rush into the cell. You can actually overhydrate yourself. If you overhydrate yourself, you can make yourself hypotonic. And this causes water to rush into the cell. And when that occurs, the cell is going to just enlarge, enlarge, enlarge. And then eventually, if it gets too big, it'll just explode. We call that lysis. Now, I don't know about you, but it's probably not a good thing to have your cells exploding. So this is also leading us out of homeostasis. Okay, now what we're really getting into with this uh, video is a discussion about diffusion and glucose. Glucose is going to diffuse across our membrane from outside of our cell to inside of our cell and it's going to do it through facilitated diffusion. It needs this channel protein to move across the membrane. Now, the reason why I chose glucose is because glucose is one of the most important molecules that we have in our body because glucose is the fuel that runs our body. So we need glucose. Every cell in our body needs glucose to function properly, okay? So we have to be pumping glucose into our cells all the time. Now, there's a little trick to keeping glucose always moving from high concentration to low concentration into our cell. And that involves an enzyme. There's an enzyme called kinase. Kinase is an enzyme that when glucose enters our cell, kinase enzyme takes the glucose and sticks a phosphate group on it. So the glucose molecule changes slightly to a molecule called glucose 6-phosphate. When kinase enzyme does this, it keeps the concentration of glucose low in the cell and high outside the cell because glucose 6-phosphate isn't the same molecule as glucose. So we just tweak it a little bit and that keeps a high concentration of glucose outside the cell always wanting to move into the cell. All right, And that leads us to this handout 13E. So let's look at 13E. Now, 13E is going to introduce us to a couple other uh, hormones that are going to be regulating glucose in our body. So um, let's get rid of me. Bye. And let's talk about this handout 3E. Now, first of all, I just have an introduction to glucose. And then we're going to talk about what glucose does and how glucose works. So if we look at this glucose, all right, um, here in green, I've got some info that you need to know about glucose. First of all, uh, like I just mentioned, glucose is our body's gasoline. It's our body's fuel. It's what we burn uh, for energy. I wrote that every cell needs glucose to make energy, all right? So every cell in our body needs glucose. And where do we get glucose? Well, we get it from the food we eat, especially carbohydrates. Now, we can talk about this a little bit when we go over the biomolecules in class, but um, essentially, 
all of our biomolecules can be turned into glucose. So we can take proteins and make glucose out of it. We can take fat and make glucose out of it. Carbohydrates are the easiest thing because they are already, uh, or glucose is already a carbohydrate. So when we take carbohydrates like starches in your potatoes or uh, sugar in your cookies, we can convert those to glucose uh, very quickly. And so we get uh, the glucose from the food we eat, the food is broken down, the glucose is added to our bloodstream, and then it's delivered to our cells. So that's what's in the purple box. The big question is, how does this happen? How do we move the glucose from our bloodstream into our cells? And that's really what this handout is showing us. So I'm going to move it up and we're going to discuss how glucose gets put into your cells. So once the glucose is in our bloodstream, we need a hormone that's made in our pancreas called insulin. Insulin is a hormone. I'm going to put a box in every handout around hormones. So insulin is a hormone that's going to take our blood sugar, our blood glucose levels, and deliver it to the cells. So insulin makes it possible for the cells to take up that glucose and use that glucose as fuel. So what insulin does is it controls our blood glucose levels by lowering our blood glucose levels. It takes these blood glucose molecules and it delivers them to our cells. That's going to lower blood glucose. See, this is a negative feedback system. We were talking about feedback systems in chapter one. Well, insulin is a hormone that's going to keep us at a set point of glucose by lowering our blood glucose levels. So insulin delivers glucose to all of our cells. Now, if you have too much glucose in your blood and all the cells are happy, we can also take this glucose and insulin can deliver it to our liver. And through a process called glycogenesis, we can turn this glucose into a different molecule called glycogen. And glycogen is basically it's a string of glucoses all bonded together and it is stored energy. So what happens is our liver is going to store glycogen and then we can take that glycogen when we need it and convert it back into glucose. That's done through a process called glycogenolysis. Glycogenolysis is going to take the stored glycogen and turn it back into glucose to raise our blood sugar. This is done through a second enzyme called glucagon. Glucagon is going to take your glycogen, perform glyco uh, glycogenolysis, and turn that glycogen back into glucose to raise your glucose levels. All right? This is a perfect example of why you would carbo load before like an athletic event. So carbo loading would be eating a bunch of carbohydrates. That car those carbohydrates are then broken down into glucose and put into our bloodstream. Our Insulin is going to take that glucose and deliver it to our cells, but our cells won't need all of that glucose. So then we'll undergo glycogenesis, turn that glucose into glycogen where it's stored in your liver. Then when it's time to run that athletic event, as we are exercising, our blood glucose levels are going to drop. We're going to say, oh gosh, we need more energy. We're going to take this stored glycogen, have glu uh, glucagon undergo glycogenolysis, and turn that glycogen into 
glucose that raises our blood glucose level that then insulin can take and deliver it to our cells, like our muscle cells, to keep our athletic activity going on. So you can see this is homeostasis. We don't want our blood sugar too high. We don't want our blood sugar too low. If our blood sugar is too high, insulin's got to take it out of the bloodstream and give it to the cells or give it to the liver to make glycogen. If our blood glucose is too low, uh, glucagon has to take this glycogen and turn it back into glucose to raise our blood glucose levels. Now, in a perfect world, we've got this nice balance. Unfortunately, what happens with our glycogen is it's stored in the liver as uh, extra energy, but if we don't use it, it can be stored long-term as fat. So this glycogen can be converted into fat. And so if you carbo load, for example, but then you don't have that athletic event, you're going to carbo load, you're going to um, take that glucose, make glycogen out of it. It's going to be stored in your liver for a couple of days. And then your body's going to be like, well, you know, we've got this stored energy. We're not using it. Let's take this stored energy and permanently store it. So we'll take this glycogen and we'll turn it into fat. And that's why a lot of these fad diets say that carbohydrates are bad for you. They're actually not bad for you. You just don't need to eat as much of them. Because if you eat a bunch of carbs that are then broken into glucose and you don't burn them off, those carbohydrates will be stored more permanently as fat. And fat is harder to burn than carbohydrates. So your fat is uh, full of a lot of energy, but it's also a reserve. So if you are eating carbs, you will never burn this fat because your fat is just waiting as long-term storage. All right, so that is handout 3E. So I hope that kind of gives you a good example of how uh, glucose has moved into a cell through facilitated diffusion, and then how glucose is uh, maintained homeostatically by our body. So I've just introduced to you two more uh, hormones. So insulin and glucagon are hormones that are going to be regulating our blood glucose levels. All right. I'll see you soon. Have a great rest of your day.